I want to ask you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, verse 14 to 30. And the theme for this morning's message is a spirit-filled ministry. A spirit-filled ministry. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for a new morning, that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for bringing us through the night, and for protecting us, for keeping us. And thank you for your love and compassion, your grace, and the salvation that has come to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Receive our praises, not only in song, but also as we now open our ears to hear the word of the living God. We pray that you would bring the word to us, as Ian Bounds said, like sugar and like dynamite. With power, with force, but also with sweetness. And as we drink of the living water, as we come to Christ, and learn from Him, may streams of living water flow from our hearts. And this we pray in His name, the name of our beloved and our friend. Amen. There was a very ordinary preacher in the 1600s by the name of John Livingston of Kilsith in Scotland. There was a conference where they had communion, the Lord's Supper conference, or a gathering of different churches. And John Livingston was asked to preach on the Monday morning. And through the night he went into the field, walked in the field, and he meditated and prayed, and he was so overwhelmed with a sense of his own inability to really bring the word of the living God, he wanted to run away. But the Lord gave him grace and strength to stand up and preach. And he preached for an hour and a half. And when he got to the application, after an hour and a half, the Spirit suddenly came down upon the congregation. And people were so under such conviction of sin, many of them even just fell to the ground in terror and in fear. And Livingston continued preaching for another hour. And because of that one sermon, 500 people were converted. Not converted in terms of so-called altar call, coming to the front and saying a sinner's prayer. No, but, but soundly and solidly converted. And they were added to the churches. And then it happened once more after that with John Livingston and his ministry. But apart from those two times, John Livingston continued a very ordinary ministry as a very ordinary preacher. So it's obvious that that one sermon was a work of the Spirit, the sovereign Spirit of the living God, the Spirit who is sovereign, who saves when and where he wants. As we read in John 3 verse 8. And it's the same spirit that came upon Jesus when Jesus was baptized. In Luke 3.22 we see the spirit coming upon Christ. But not just like on the congregation to whom Livingston preached. But the Spirit came upon Jesus and rested on him, says John 1, 32 and 33. The Spirit came on him without measure, John 3, 34. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, says Acts 10, 38. And so Jesus had a more powerful ministry than any preacher in the history of the world. And this is what we will see in Luke 4. Verse 14 to 30. So first of all, 
a ministry of power. Let's read Luke 4 verse 14 up to 22. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he went and stood in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, or he went to the synagogue, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Only to there and then we'll continue later on from 22b to verse 30. J.I. Packer said of Martin Lloyd Jones's ministry, I never heard such preaching. It came to me with a force of electric shock, bringing to at least one of his listeners more of a sense of God than any other man I knew. And if Lloyd Jones's ministry was came with such force, with such power, how powerful was Jesus' ministry? Now, we saw some weeks ago, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, or the Spirit came upon him when he was baptized in the Jordan River. Chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. And then chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, we saw last week, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So now as he goes into the wilderness, he's filled with the Spirit. And then after the 40 days of temptation, Jesus returns from the desert. And verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And it's this very same Spirit, through the Spirit and by the same Spirit, that Jesus preached powerful sermons and did miracles. And so so the news about Jesus now spreads everywhere. So we see that in verse 14. A report about him went out through, through all the surrounding country. And we know this includes miracles because we read in Matthew, in the parallel in Matthew chapter 4, that Jesus healed everyone and he went about preaching in the synagogues and he did miracles And we know he cast out demons. And so people are just amazed. They are amazed. They are in awe. Verse 15 um, tells us that Jesus goes about and he's being glorified by all. Everyone is amazed. They're hanging on his words also as he goes about preaching in their synagogues. As we read in, in different sections, the kind of preaching Jesus brought, but everyone can understand. He preaches with power. He preaches with authority. He doesn't quote uh, Rabbi so-and-so. Rather, he says, I say to you. And he speaks with this authority. And the great throng hears him gladly. We read in Mark 12. And even in John, his enemies in John 7, they say, no one ever spoke like this man. And so when he comes and preaches a sermon now in his hometown of Nazareth, now we see the secret. Now we see what is behind this powerful preaching. In verse 16, comes to his hometown, comes to Nazareth, and now he's going to preach the word to them. But let me give a bit of background, and then we'll move into this to show you what was the secret to the power of his ministry. So on the Sabbath... Uh, Jesus, according to custom, this is a good custom, good habit. So according to custom, he goes to the synagogue, just like we are supposed to form the good habit of gathering with believers. 
and not fall into the trap and the habit of, of staying away and neglecting the gathering of God's people, Hebrews 10.25. So Jesus, good custom, goes to the synagogue. Now, a synagogue is not the same as the Jerusalem temple. The Jerusalem temple is the place where the priests brought sacrifices. We know that. They sacrificed animals for the sins of the people. So it's like the animal gets killed instead of you dying for your own sin. Now, the synagogue is not like that. The synagogue is rather it's places that the Jews built in their towns, places of worship. It's like, let's say, the Jewish church, if you would like to, Jewish church building, if you want to call it that. You can just check on the internet, type in uh, synagogue. That's quite a difficult spelling, so make sure you spell it correctly. Synagogue uh, ESV, and then you go on to images and, or, or image of synagogue ESV, English Standard Version, and you'll find a picture of a synagogue and see what it looks like. And a typical order of service in a synagogue, they would start by, by saying the Shema. The Shema is in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it continues, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And then it goes right to verse 9. And in Deuteronomy 11 and Numbers 15, so there's the different, uh, different words of blessing and also words of instruction, really. So they would say that, and after each passage, there would be a prayer of blessing. And then after the prayer of blessing, they had a cycle of 18 different prayers that would... So today you pray one prayer, and then next Sabbath, you do the next prayer, and the Sabbath after the next, until you've covered the cycle of 18 prayers, and then you start over again. And so they would take a prayer from that cycle, and pray the prayer, or read the prayer, and then the congregation would respond with a loud and audible Amen. And then the leader of the synagogue, he could ask any man to come and to read a section from the law, and then he could ask someone to read a section from the prophets. The law is the first five books of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then the prophets. Uh, another section of the Old Testament. And then as he reads, line upon line, someone would translate, because it's read in Hebrew, but they no longer speak Hebrew. They speak Aramaic. So someone would read the Hebrew, and someone would translate into Aramaic. And then after that, that leader would now ask someone to preach, uh, to expound, to explain the re a reading from the law, or the section from the prophets. And then when that was done, there was a prayer of blessing again, and the congregation would respond with, Amen. So now we come to Luke 4, and you see the ruler of the synagogue, and he asks Jesus, would you read the section from the prophets? Just like in Acts 13 verse 15, the apostle Paul is asked in the synagogue, would you please address us and preach. So Jesus now is asked, he needs to read the section and then preach. And the people are very proud. It's like any small town. Any small town, the people are really excited when someone from our town, they are now a celebrity. And so obviously they ask Jesus, wouldn't Jesus do the reading and the preaching? And when Jesus does, he starts the reading in verse 16. And it says, he stood up to read. So that's out of respect for the word of God. Like in Nehemiah 9 verse 3, stands up for the reading of the scriptures. And then he, rolls, he unfold, unrolls the scroll, verse uh, 17. It's not a book like, like our books, you know, the Jewish scroll. So he unrolls the scroll. And then he finds Isaiah 61, <coughs> verse 1 to 2a. And this is what he reads. Now this is Luke's rendering here uh, in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so now we see here, just like at Jesus' baptism, where the Trinity is involved, the Son is baptized, the Spirit comes upon Him, the Father says, This is my beloved Son. So the same in Jesus' ministry, the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity are involved. 
uh, the Spirit of the Lord. So there you have Spirit of the Lord. There's the Father is upon me, the Son. So there you have the Trinity in the ministry of Christ. And the Spirit uh, anoints Jesus. But he anoints him in his human nature so that Christ, with great authority, with great power, can preach the Word of God to people and can do miracles so that everyone can see he is the Messiah. That's why he says in verse 80, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to do all these things. Just like in Matthew 12, 28, by the Spirit of God I cast out demons. Or Acts 10, 38, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good. He went about doing miracles everywhere. Healing people. And so through the Spirit he receives power. And first of all, power for what? Verse 18, he's anointed me to proclaim good news. Good news to sinners. Good news. The good news that God forgives sinners. That God saves sinners from hell and from judgment and from death. And from the power of Satan. And that God gives them eternal life. And it's good news, he says, to the poor. It's, it's, it's to those who realize we have nothing. And so Jesus preaches to them a message. A message where he says, yes, you are poor, but I've come to bring spiritual riches, heavenly riches, eternal riches. And then he says, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives. Sent me from where? He's been sent by the Father from heaven to come down to earth to proclaim this liberty to captives. So liberty, freedom, freedom from bondage and from slavery and from sin and from Satan and from death and from hell. Freedom doesn't come through some professional person. And you go to this council and he casts out demons from you. No, that's not how, how liberty comes. Liberty comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Liberty comes through the truth of the gospel you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. But we know if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Liberty comes through Hebrews 2, verse 12 to 14, or 14 to 14 and 15, where we read that Jesus also became a man, so that through death, he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Liberty comes through 1 John 3 verse 8. For this reason the Son of God appeared to break or destroy the works of the devil. So it doesn't matter how trapped you are, how much you are in the bonds and the chains of sin, Jesus Christ can set you free. He can break bars of iron. He can break doors of steel. He can break the chains of death. He can bring you from darkness to light. Verse 18, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. And also, recovering of sight to the blind. Verse 18. Now that goes for people who, who were were physically blind, they couldn't see. But the healing of blind people in Jesus' ministry was really an illustration also to show that Jesus can open the spiritual eyes of people. He can give them spiritual sight so, so they can see the truth. Like in John 9 or in Acts 9, the Apostle Paul is blind for three days and then he can see once again. Or in 2 Corinthians 4, Satan blinds people. But then through the preaching of the gospel, God shines the light into their heart. And he opens their hearts. And he shows them the gospel. He shows them the truth. He shows them the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so for you, if the word of God doesn't make sense, if you read the Bible, or you hear the preaching of the Bible, and it just doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't move you, it does nothing for you, well, then ask God, open my eyes. I cannot see. Open my eyes. Because if you want to make sense of life, 
but you want to make sense of it without Jesus, you will remain blind. So you, you'll think you are able to see, but actually you're still blind. you like that liberal theologian, liberal pastor in Kempton Park in our town, who, who gives his so-called salvation testimony on the internet, and it's no salvation testimony at all. He just tells us how he moves from conservative and biblical theology to liberal theology, and why he came to a point where his eyes were just opened, uh, you know, to see that Jesus never rose from the dead, there was no virgin birth, Jesus never did miracles, and then he describes it as, that's when he was born again. Or like a man he used to be in our church, he's now in heaven, but this man told me that his son uh, turned his back on everything his father had taught him. Everything that his father taught him from the scriptures about Jesus and the gospel. And his son is now an atheist. And his son said, Dad, now finally, it's like the scales have fallen from my eyes. I can now see. Or like the people, the Pharisees in John 9, verse 39 we read of John 9, Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, <clears throat> that those who may not, who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And then Jesus also came to, <clears throat> end of verse 18, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So Jesus comes and he and he, he makes whole those who are broken, those who have been broken, those who are discouraged. He binds up their wounds. He binds up the brokenhearted. He doesn't break the bruised reed, but he heals it. He doesn't blow out the faintly burning wick, the can, faintly burning candle, but he cups his hands around it and gently blows so that it can get oxygen and uh, the wax is removed and it the melting wax and it can burn brightly again. So is your heart broken? Your heart has been broken by your own sin. Perhaps your heart has been broken by the devil and his temptations or your heart has been broken <clears throat> by the sin of other people, how they've sinned against you or your heart has been broken by your very difficult circumstances. Jesus can restore you. He comes to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And he can do so even if you've been under bondage for decades. Like that woman in Luke 13, for 18 years, and Jesus restores her. Now she had a bodily illness, but it was also caused by spiritual things. But for you, perhaps you're spiritually broken. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can restore you. And then verse 19 says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now this thought comes from Deuteronomy 25. Every 50 years, they called it the year of Jubilee. Every 50th year, all debt was written off in Israel. And even slaves, slaves were set free. And so the, the, the point Jesus is making is come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. <coughs> he fulfills that once and for all, is to say that he sets us free as slaves. We are no longer slaves of the devil. He sets us free. He writes off, off all our debt. Now perhaps you, you are afraid of, uh, and you think that, that God is just out to get you. God is out to punish you. I think you've got a wrong view of God. When Jesus quoted this passage, he purposefully stopped there because the rest of his, Isaiah 61 verse 2 says that he has not only come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but also the day of vengeance, the vengeance of our God. But Jesus stopped there because it is not the day of vengeance now. The day of vengeance is not yet. That will come when Jesus returns. But now is the year of the Lord's favor. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the favorable time, uh, says Paul in a very similar way in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
So do you believe that, that verse 18 and 19, it's true? Do you believe Jesus is speaking the truth in those verses? Do you accept Jesus as your only hope? Are you weary? You are tired of fighting. You are tired of fighting in your own heart and wrestling and fighting sin and fighting with Satan attacking you. Bow your knee before Jesus as your Lord. And if you do so, your sin will be forgiven and God will accept you. God will adopt you as his own child. Now when Jesus finished the reading and he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, verse 20. Then he sat down, we read, and that is to show humility when we teach the word of God. And my standing here so you can see me and also a respect for the word of God. But Jesus sat down and then he started teaching the people. And then it says, he began to say, uh, meaning this is not the whole sermon, this is a summary. <clears throat> and everyone's eyes in the synagogue, everyone's eyes are fixed on him, verse 20. So they're really they're in, in expectation. No one's daydreaming, no one's drifting off, no one's dozing off, no one's falling asleep. That's what happens under a spiritual ministry. You cannot sleep. Your ears are perked and your eyes are nailed. It's fixed on the preacher because you want to hear the word of God. And then Jesus says to everyone present in verse 21, I am the Messiah. That's basically what he says. Isaiah 61 is, is being fulfilled right in front of your eyes today. Now that is some statement to make. Either Jesus is lying, or Jesus is mad, crazy, or Jesus is speaking the truth. Now, let's just say it cannot be a lie, because 1 Peter 2 verse 22 says Jesus never lied. So either, either Peter is lying or Jesus is lying here. But it must be true that <laughs> Jesus cannot lie. So Peter must be right and Jesus must be speaking the truth. Even Jesus' enemies in Matthew 22 verse 16. They said Jesus is above reproach. Jesus, we know you always speak true. You are honest. They knew that. And when Jesus says, who of you... Uh, convicts me of sin in John 8 verse 46 no one could answer so that's that option, that's not an option we can't say Jesus is lying when he says I'm the Messiah Jesus cannot be crazy it, it cannot be that he's mad although some people did think he's mad in John 10 verse 20 to 21 they said he's got a demon and he's, he's insane uh, but that they said after Jesus had preached a wonderful sermon on the Good Shepherd. Now, you just read that sermon in John 10, on the Good Shepherd. That doesn't sound like someone who is insane that says those, those kinds of things. It doesn't sound like someone who is mad. So the only option we have left is, when Jesus says in verse 21, I'm the Messiah, and this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, He is the Messiah. He is the Messiah of, of Isaiah 61. I don't know if you've ever doubted that. Have you ever doubted that? And thought, Jesus cannot be that one. Jesus cannot be the Son of God. Why are we believing these things? Can I ask you, could you give even one, only one, only one reason that will prove Jesus is not the Messiah. Jesus is not the Son of God. And that reason that you give, could you back it up with fact, please? Back it up with facts. When Jesus finished preaching, Everyone in the synagogue, they were amazed at his words. Verse 22. Amazed at these words of grace that were coming out of his mouth. These gracious words. Just like in verse 15. Being glorified by all. But the people in Nazareth, very, very quickly, they all turns into skepticism. And they say in verse 22b, but he cannot be the Messiah. He can't be the Messiah. This is just Joseph's son. I remember how that kind of thing happened once when I was preaching in 2014. A man visited our church about six times, maybe eight times. And, uh, and after I preached a sermon on heaven, he wrote me an email saying, this sermon has changed my life. Thank you, thank you, you've changed my life. And I didn't change his life. Uh, because two, two months after this, 
he wrote me a message saying that a very, very strong language and ugly language and attacking me, saying I'm a false teacher. And he's going to spread it everywhere on social media to warn people that I'm a false teacher. And then he told a lie. I wrote him a nice mail and I was gentle. And I said to him, thank you for your message. Let me explain. This is why I um, believe what I believe and you're attacking me on this. Uh, and then I ended with, hope you're doing fine. How's your wife doing? How is your son doing? And then he lied and he responded, I've been divorced for many years now. Uh, but he lied. He lied. Two years later, or three years later, I found him in, saw him in pick and pay. I greeted him and his wife. He thought I didn't know who he was when he sent the email. But I knew who he was. Because his name was at the bottom. He thought maybe I'd forgotten his name. Uh, and then it's, it's the same guy I know because his wife in that same time wrote me an email attacking me and I know her name. It was also at the bottom of the email. Actually, not an email, a comment on the blog, but their names were there. So it shows you, it just goes to show how, how a sermon can really move someone without that person ever changing. And so it's possible to love sermons and to love hearing sermons, but you're not changed. So to, to enjoy sermons, to enjoy preaching, even good preaching, even spiritual preaching like Jesus' preaching, that is not enough. God wants you to be obedient. To not merely hear the word, but do the word. Do not build your house on sand, but on the rock. I'm very glad to say that many people in our church, they are obedient. They are obedient. When they hear the preaching of the word, the word explained, they obey the word. But then I am sad to say that there are some people in our church, they ignore the word. They ignore God's word like they would ignore a stop sign. For instance, when I encourage people to pray with other believers, I'm not saying you need to pray aloud then. If you're afraid of praying aloud, ask the Lord to help you. But how often have I not asked this? I do not get a response from many. It's like they ignore that. We will not pray with other believers, even though Scripture commands us again and again. Some people just ignore the gathering of believers. They're not at the worship services. Other people... They can be at the evening service, but they have no desire to. They're not interested. Other people do not read their Bibles. And the Lord wants them to meditate on the Word. And others just will not leave their sin. Disobedient. And if that's you, you're in a dangerous spot. And you're like these people. Love hearing the preaching will not do it. Number two, a ministry of offense. That's verse 22b to 30. So first a powerful ministry now, an offensive ministry. 22b to 30. And they said, 22b, is, this not, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless, you'll quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we heard you've said in Capernaum, do ye in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Not every ministry that offends people is a spiritual ministry. Uh, so you've got a, a preacher like that independent Baptist guy, that fundamentalist in, in the United States, Stephen Anderson. And Stephen Anderson, he's offensive. And he attacks everyone. 
And Stephen Anderson is known more for what he is against than what he is for. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're against this and we're against that and we don't believe this and we don't believe that. And in the end you've got nothing you believe. So don't think that someone is really spiritual just because he offends people. But on the other hand, it is true that every spirit-filled ministry will offend people. Why? Because it, it points to people's sin. It shows their sin and it, and it destroys and shatters their false ideas about God and sin and salvation. They don't want to hear that homosexuality is sin. They don't want to hear that hell is a reality or that you cannot go get to heaven through your own religion, through any religion, but only through Christ. They don't want to hear that you cannot serve Jesus and live with your girlfriend. You cannot follow Christ and be sexually immoral. They don't want to hear that Jesus did not come to give you earthly riches. They don't want to hear Jesus does not support your political party. But you should become part of his kingdom. Not he become part of your little kingdom and your politics. They don't want to hear that. Just like the Jews. The Jews didn't want a Messiah that looks just like them. He's just an ordinary person. Oh, in their thoughts, he's just the son of Joseph, verse 22a, 22b. Like in chapter 3 also, verse 23, they supposed he's the son of Joseph. They didn't know he was born of a virgin, as we saw in chapter 1. And many people are still offended at Jesus. They offended him. He's just an ordinary human. Say the Muslims and say the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Jews today. They are offended at Jesus, like the liberals. He's not born of a virgin. He didn't do miracles. He didn't rise from the dead. Or like the atheists. Like Jacqueline Glenn, the atheist, said to, to Ray Comfort. She said to him, that you really expect me to swallow all that stuff, all those fairy tales. And he said, I don't expect, expect you to swallow anything but your pride. You see that to these people the cross is offensive. It's offensive. Because they do not think they deserve to be punished. How can we say Jesus died in our place? That would imply I deserve that punishment. When Jesus took the punishment for sinners on a cross. Like an atheist said to me, I don't need a sacrifice for my sins. <clears throat> now we are, I'm glad to say that as far as I know, no one, our, no one in our congregation is offended at Jesus in that way. And yet... We are offended at Jesus. We're offended at Jesus sometimes. He offends us because he, he, why does he allow me to go through such difficult trials? I'm angry at him. He offends me. He offends me because he took a loved one from me. And I'm angry at him. He offends me because he will not hear my prayer. I've asked this and he won't answer it in my way. He offends me because he don't, doesn't answer me quickly enough. I've been praying for months or even years about this matter. And so in, because we're offended, we then, we then leave our Bibles. I, I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. And I stop coming to church and I stop praying. And we act just like these Jews. Jesus is just the son of Joseph. Instead of Jesus is the son of God. And so we're skeptical and indirectly we say, I can't believe that you're the Messiah. If you were the Messiah, then we just like these people. We say, if you're the Messiah, you could do miracles. Just like we heard you did miracles in Capernaum, why don't you do miracles here in Nazareth? Why don't you do miracles in my life? Why don't you come through for me? And it says in verse 23, we heard you did miracles in Capernaum. In other words, we, we just heard this. We don't believe it. Do it. Prove it. Show it's true. Save your reputation. Come on, physician. Heal yourself. Verse 23. Save your reputation. Just like you can save people from a sick bed. Save your reputation as the Messiah. Now listen. If you say anything like that, then we're speaking for the devil. We're speaking for the devil. Because the devil, Satan, in verse 3 and verse 9 said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, do this and that. Prove yourself. Do a miracle. And we do the same kind of thing. Prove yourself. Then I will follow you and believe in you. If you help me in this situation, then I will do such and such. And serve you and be your disciple. So we're speaking for the devil. And we're speaking like the devil. And we like the Jews. We like atheists. They will not believe unless they see miracles. 1 Corinthians 1.22 They demand signs. 
And we know it's not true. We know that even if they see the miracle, they'd rather say, no, my eyes tricked me, it wasn't true. And so you're missing it all. You're missing the love of God in your life. You don't even see His love in your life. You don't even see His goodness in your life. It's He who provides food. It's He who make the sun, makes the sun shine on you. It's God who gave us all this rain. It's God who forgives your sins. It's God who sent those people in your life to help you and to do you good. And because you just miss all of this, you don't go to God. You don't ask Him for His help but you try and find your own solutions. But it will end in a mess, as it always does. It's just going to end in a mess if you try to help yourself out of this one. And in the end, you're going to have to go to God anyway and say, say, Lord, I've messed up. Please, will you help me? So why not just do it from the start and say, please help me, Lord? But the Jews wouldn't accept this. Just like they, they rejected the Old Testament prophets, they rejected the miracles even that the Old Testament prophets did, like Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. They rejected all of that. And in the same way, here they reject Jesus. They reject Jesus. They reject the good news of God's God who, who will come to set the captives free. Or everything in verse 18 to 19. Preaching good news, giving sight to the blind. They reject all of this. They reject Jesus. They rejected Jeremiah in the Old Testament, the other prophets. And that's why God turned to the Gentiles. He turned his back on the Jews. Just like he even did in the days of Elijah and Elisha. As we read from verse 24, he says, No prophet's acceptable in his hometown. Then he goes on to give two illustrations. Verse 25 to 27. Elijah and Elisha both did miracles. They both preached God's word to the people. But God's people, Israel, rejected them. And so God turns to the Gentiles. Elijah goes to a widow in Sidon, that's a Gentile area, and Elisha, he heals a, a Syrian, leper, a, a Gentile. And this is the same when Jesus came to earth. And they know that. Jesus is going to turn away from the Jews because they reject him. He will go to the Gentiles. And when the people of Nazareth heard this, verse 28, they were filled with fury. They are filled with anger. They are gnashing their teeth so angry they are. Flush that their faces become red with anger. They hate it. They hate it. They cannot believe that God will ever turn his back on Israel and choose the Gentiles. That's why they were so angry with the Apostle Paul in Acts 21 verse 21 and, and following. But God did turn his back on the Jews. He did turn his back. He took away this privilege from the Jews and went to the Gentiles. And so in their anger, these Jews rise up against Jesus. Verse 29, they, they take him out of town, cast him out of town because they want to throw him off a cliff. Just like Satan, jump off the temple. And so now these people want to throw him off a cliff. And so through, through some kind of miracle, verse 30, passing through their midst, he went away. Jesus just very calmly walked through their midst. They couldn't throw him down. It's not his time yet. It's not the determined hour where he would die according to the Father's schedule. And so they weren't successful in killing Jesus. But when the time was right, they did kill him. They did rise against him again. And they threw him out of the town again, like here. They threw him out of Jerusalem and they murdered him. And by throwing him out, like they did here, it's like they're saying, we reject you, you are not our Messiah. And do we not say the same thing? Do we not but say the same thing every time we sin against Jesus? Do we not reject him as our Messiah every time we sin? He's not our Messiah. He's not my Messiah. Throw him out. Oh Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. We don't rejoice in verse 18 and 19. We don't count verse 18 and 19 a privilege. He's come to bring all this good news and liberty and freedom and spiritual sight and the Lord's favor. We reject that. We are rebellious. We stand up against Him if things don't happen according to my calendar and my selfish desires. Do not reject the Lord. You don't know how quickly He will return. You don't know if He will return to your life. Verse 30, passing through their midst, he went away. 
So be thankful and appreciate Jesus. And don't think you and I deserve anything more than hell itself. We deserve nothing more. We only deserve punishment. So why not seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near? Why not come while he says, with open arms, arms outstretched, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And then Jesus will be to you and he will respond to you as my senior pastor responded to me. In Nelspreet, Dr. Jan Fink, one night, my, I, my sister and I were driving, she in her car, I in my car, it was late at night, uh, close to 11 o'clock, and suddenly she got a flat, flat wheel, and we pulled off at the side of the road, and accidentally, it was raining, I, just out of habit, I locked my car, with the key still in, in the ignition, I just pressed the button down and shut the door. <gasps> and there I was, and we had to sit in her car. Luckily, I had my cell phone with me. And that pastor came, Jan Fink, came all the way from Nelspreet because the spare key for the church's car, it's not my car, it's the church's car, was in the church safe. And so he drove all that way with the people I was staying with at that time as a bachelor, Dennis Williams. Him and Dennis Williams came. And they drove 130 kilometers to bring the key and to help us change the flat and take it into the the closest garage, petrol station, pump it, bring it back. And then we drove back to Nelspreet and we got there after 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. And next morning at 8 o'clock, as we walked into the church office, he greeted me, good morning, morning Ivor, as if he had a good night's rest. And nothing had happened. And I I apologized. I said, I'm really sorry about last night. And he said, no, it's no problem either. That is exactly how God will be to us. How he will respond to you. If you come with a broken heart. With remorse for your sin. Repentance of sin. And you come to your father. He will forgive you completely. And he will not remind you of a single sin. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity this morning of hearing your word and of spending time with you in fellowship with you. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help us to accept and embrace you, not only in our theology as the Messiah, but in our practice and in our day-to-day life. Amen.